today we have kind of a special setup um, for you all who are participating. So the first half I'm going to be talking about opioids um, specific to Virginia and, and how that plays mm -hmm. out with regards to addiction. So I'm going to kind of cram a lot of information in about maybe 30, hopefully 30 minutes for you. Um, we'll take a break then. And then we're going to jump into the revive training. So it's going to, we're going to go through all of that. If you have to get up and go to the bathroom, if you need to grab a drink, if your phone is buzzing off the hook, please do turn your volume down so we don't all hear it. But feel free to get up and um, go out. That's not a problem. But it's just a good kind of transitioning point in between the presentation on opioids and then actually jumping into the training. Mm -hmm. So my name is Amira Turner. I am the Revo Revive, I don't know what I oversee. I'm the Revive coordinator for the state of Virginia, so I oversee our opioid overdose and naloxone education trainings. Um, I am also finishing up two, master two master's degrees, um, a Master of Science in Addiction Studies. I'm currently working on my thesis. Woo <laughs> and then I'm finishing my Master of Social Work. My last requirement is um, an internship this summer. So once that's done, I'm done, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, Thank you. It has been so far, so it just needs to keep burning for a few more you know, months, and we'll be good. Um, so that's about the introduction I'm going to give you. And we're going to jump right in, because I have a lot of information to cover for you and um, want to make sure I get through it in time. So what we're talking about today, we're going to cover um, kind of the background of how all of this started with opioids, um, because they've been around for a long time, but we've seen a lot of trends um, progress progressed over the years, and so I'm going to kind of go through the reasons behind that. We'll talk about the direct impact that we've seen here in Virginia. Um, we're going to discuss addiction and cover the biobasis of addiction, as well as um, how that is incorporating opioids specific to addiction and addictive disorders. And then we're going to jump into our current state of emergency here in Virginia. Move into specific state level efforts um, aimed at combating the opioid crisis and we'll look at the REVIVE program. We have an emergency department pilot I'm going to go over quickly with you and then we also have um, different types of treatment which many of you are already aware of. Once we're done with that, we're going to move into the um, actual REVIVE training. Okay? So when we finish this, we'll take a break, maybe five, ten minutes as long as you all need and then we're going to jump back and go into specific for REVIVE. So, background of opioid use, um, because we know heroin's been around for a long time, right, but what actually kind of unfolded to lead us to the number of opioid use disorders that we're seeing today is in 1996, um, the American Pain Society, or American, yeah, Society introduced the, fra the phrase, um, pain is the fifth vital sign, right? So we're looking at body temperature, we're looking at um, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and we're adding pain into that, right? So when you add pain as sort of a vital sign that we're checking, anytime you go into the doctor, right, we're going to look for ways to treat pain, and that's going to become a priority, right? So because of that, um, the Veterans Health Administration then mandated that anytime somebody came in to get services through them, um, they had a rating scale, right? So they had to then rate that and enter it electronically. So by 1999, that's when we saw um, our overdose deaths, including opioids, quadruple. Okay. So opioids in America, right? Um, we had to come up with some creative ways of treating this because it's such an important thing that we're all looking at. Um, and there wasn't a lot of education on how addictive opioids could be, right, at the time. So here in the United States, we make up less than 5% of our global population. Yes. We're consuming over 80% globally of the opioids. So keep that in mind as we're kind of progressing through some of the next slides. Nora Volkow is the director of NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, has identified that for individuals who are on pain medic medications for chronic pain, um, about 7% of all of those individuals are going to become addicted. Okay. Today, there's more than 4.7 million. The number keeps growing of individuals who um, are dependent on prescription pain medications, and it's about 2% of our population. 650,000 prescriptions are dispensed. Um, 3,900 people initiate non-medical use of prescription pain medication. And then we also have, and this is daily, 
580 people initiating heroin use every day. 91 people a day are losing their lives, this is nationally still, because of an opioid-related overdose. There's some numbers that you see that are going to be higher than that. That's looking at all drug overdoses, so I believe that number's closer to 120. 91 people, though, is opioid-specific. So here's Virginia. Um, and what I like to show on this chart, we have kind of this upward trend of you know, an increase in the number, and this is overdose deaths that we're seeing, right? So we've got this upward trend. Between 2015 and 2016, we had a 40% increase in the number of overdose deaths that we saw. 40% increase. There's a reason for that, so we're going to jump into that. Um, 2017, we actually do have the data. I submitted this chart. I got it um, a few days ago. But we're over 1,200 people, so we are still over what was projected um, as of last year for the number of overdose deaths. So the number keeps going up, right? No matter what efforts we're currently doing, um, it's still going up. So I want to go through um, addiction just a little bit. I thought I had a, a slide before that, but that's fine. We're jumping right into the biobasis of addiction. We talk about this biological component. Um, I think that this is a great chart to kind of highlight what that actually means, right? Because um, it's more of a, the disease model, newer trend, what's happening in the brain, right? Um, and I think that it's important to really go through and understand that. So, hey, I just noticed you're here. <laughs> so each of these areas are sort of uh, the main areas affected, not the only areas by any means, but the main areas that are affected when addiction takes over. And so. The thalamus is up here in blue, and you also see where the thalamus exists in the brain. And on this chart here, we see kind of the areas and things that are going on within that region. So thalamus is our forebrain structure, and it's where our reward systems take place. Um, and it includes our dopamine and opioid peptides, which are the reward neurotransmitters that play an important role with addiction, right? So down here we see that's where our binge and intoxication stage is taking place. So we're looking at reinforcement, right, and habits. And so both of those areas start to transition and it's reinforcing our use and creating habits to use more and more, right? The amygdala, this is an interesting area because what that has is our corticotropin releasing factor, which essentially controls our level of stress, right? Um, down here we see the negative um, affect and withdrawal. And so that's how our body responds when the drugs are no longer in the body, right? People have a very high level of stress. They have a very high level of negative affect, right? Um, and so that's what's going on. It's actually affecting that part of the brain, which in, in part is what's causing the, the withdrawal and negative affect that we see. Our prefrontal cortex, that's where we make our executive decisions, right? We have the rational thought processes, and we, de we determine whether something's a good idea, whether it's good for us, right? Um, this area is disrupted. And so what ends up happening is we have our conditioned responses, right? Those conditioned cues, things that we do with cognitive behavioral therapy is trying to restructure that process. It's where our, preoccup our preoccupation and anticipation of what's going to happen when we take those drugs is going on, right? So that's where our cravings come into play. Um, and it's also where we decide things that may not actually be a good idea are a good idea, right? We make those quick snap judgments. So what is it? Um, and this is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which is being universally accepted as kind of the general definition for addiction. It's a chronic and relapsing brain disease characterized by tolerance, right, where you can use more and more and you get less and less results. Physiological dependence, um, that's characterized by withdrawal, right, when it's not in our body. Reinforcement, so positive reinforcement where we experience pleasurable effects from it that transitions then into negative reinforcement, which we were talking about where our affect goes down, our body starts having a negative response, and when we use the substance, it takes that away, right? That's negative reinforcement. Um, motivation, right? So you may not have been motivated when you first started, or it might have been something you just wanted to try, but eventually you get into that, what we call drug-seeking behavior, where you are very highly motivated to get to the substance that you're using. Um, and then we're going to continue to use it, doesn't matter what kind of consequences, socially, psychologically, physiologically, right? Um, we're going to continue to use. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about addiction. 
we just talked about a few of the ways drugs are changing brain structure and how the brain works. What we do know also is dependence and tolerance. They're both components of addiction. So if you are struggling with an addic addiction or substance use disorder, right, you're going to have both of those. But it doesn't mean that because somebody has dependence or tolerance, they are addicted, right? So if you consider um, going to the doctor for anxiety and they prescribe you a benzodiazepine, typically they'll start you off at um, one level of dosage, right? And they might increase that over time. So you're building tolerance until you get to whatever dose is correct for you. When you stop taking that medication, um, and so just because you're on a higher dose, that doesn't mean that you're addicted, right? Um, when you stop taking it, you don't just stop cold turkey because you may experience withdrawal, right? So they're going to taper you back down. Again, that does not mean that you have an addiction. Um, but again, when you do have an addiction, you're going to see both of those. We see long-lasting um, changes, and that leads to harmful behaviors. If you have a very high tolerance, you're probably going to end up using more than you intended to use, right? Um, and you can't just stop using on your own. All of your activities are focused on getting or using those drugs, and you're going to continue to use in spite of any negative consequences that you experience. So how is opioid use different? Um, we have this natural system in our body. It's the opiate system, right? And so before our opioids, which is just synthetic, um, came about something that's man-made, right? Opiates is natural. Opioid, man-made, used interchangeably frequently. It's not a big deal. Um, but our opiate system already existed. So if we experienced a tremendous amount of pain, um, gotten in a very bad car accident, that system kicks in. It binds a specific receptor site that we already have in our brain for that opiate system, and it causes the pain relief that we're supposed to get from our opioids that they've now made to mimic that, right? And so if you go back and consider that you know, pain became that fifth vital sign, um, they wanted to create something to mimic that. They wanted to create something to resolve that issue. And so opioids came about, and they were very effective, right? And because they were so effective, exposure was very common, right? Because it's a huge thing in the doctor's handbook, and they didn't know much better either, right? So exposure to opioids became um, common among people. I don't know many people who've never been exposed to opioids. And also, if you then consider what Dr. Volkow has found, almost 10%, right, 7% of people on chronic pain medication are likely to become addicted. So high exposure, very addictive, um, and that kind of leads into what we're looking at today here. Um, Opioid addiction occurs very quickly. So I've included this chart here. I really like it. It just shows kind of the different qualities or characteristics that we're looking at when we look at different drugs um, and addict addictive potential. What we see here, um, heroin is at the top, but depending on how you're administering a drug, um, it could be if we're talking about the fentanyl, carfentanyl, right, or even prescription pain medications. It's just that way it's administered um, that will include it in that heroin area. But what we see is we're looking at the speedy effect or how fast it takes to take in effect, right? Um, so if it's got a speedy effect, it's addictive. How intense the effect is is going to play a role, right? Also addictive. And heroin, other opioids, very addictive, and they have a very intense effect for individuals. Short lasting, so this is an interesting one. If it doesn't last very long, you're likely to take more sooner, right? So that's where you start reinforcing that use. Um, and then physical withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal from opioids is extreme, and people will avoid it with everything they have. And so because of that, you're going to continue to use. So all of those put together leads to that higher um, addictive potential that we see there. Also, the number of deaths from drug overdoses, um, opioid-specific, are exceeding those of traffic fatalities and guns. Can it wait? Okay, um, I will, I'll grab questions actually right at the end, if that's okay. And if you need to just write it down, because I just have so much to get through and I don't want to. Okay. So here we go at our crisis, right? Um, and I mentioned that 40% increase that we saw in um, 2016, right? The opioid addiction crisis was declared a public health emergency um, in November of 2016 by Dr. Marissa Levine, who at the time was our, our health commissioner. We've got some changes going on, right, um, in our administration. But that was her role at the time. And 
She did this because we were seeing an increase in the number of overdoses and the increase in the number of overdose deaths, right? Um, but also because, and that was occurring because, we had the introduction of some much stronger synthetic opioids I just mentioned, fentanyl and carfentanil. So I like to give crash courses on both of these just so people really understand what it is we're talking about. Um, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine that you would get if you went to the doctor and had major surgery, right? So we're looking at 50 to 100 times more potent than that. It's pretty potent. Carfentanil is 50 to 100 times more potent than fentanyl. So at the very top end of that, we're looking at 10,000 times more potent than what we would go to the hospital and receive if we had some surgery. The carfentanil, it's a veterinary medicine. It's something used in very large animals like elephants or um, you know, rhinos, right? But the stuff that we're seeing, and the fentanyl, carfentanil we're seeing that's being mixed into the drugs, that's not things that are being made in a pharmaceutical lab here for our elephants, right, or our rhinos. That's stuff that's being made in another country and brought over here. Um, because of that, we have no way of knowing what's actually in any product somebody might get off of the street, right? And probably the individual that's selling it off the street has no idea what's in there. Um, so that's where all of this is coming in play, right? And that's what's causing so many new cases of overdoses. So if we consider the addictive potential, right, of opioids, um, exposure to opioids being so common, so, so many more people are becoming addictive. Now we're also including what we needed to do a long time ago is regulate prescription, right, prescribing practices, and that's starting to happen. But where are people turning if they can't get their prescriptions anymore, right? So a lot more people are now moving there to get whatever their drug of choice is um, to continue to support and alleviate the withdrawal that they're experiencing. And withdrawal um, has been described as pretty much feeling like you're going to die, right? So anything you can do to avoid it. And, so, and we've also talked about the different components of the brain that change once you're addicted, right? So there's a lot of things going into somebody who is at that point where they are starting to go into the street. So one thing that um, was initiated as a result of the statewide standing public health emergency that were declared um, is a statewide standing order for naloxone. Um, anybody here know we're under one? Okay, good. So what that means is we essentially in Virginia have a blanket prescription written across our state. So each and every one of us has this invisible floating prescription, hangs out with us. If and when we feel like having that filled, we can go directly to the pharmacist and request to have it filled for us. We don't have to go to our doctor first. We don't have to make a call to our doctor and ask for it to be written. It is still a prescription, so it has to come from a pharmacist, or there's other ways, including um, having gone through a revived training and going to the health department that you can also access it. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is my chart and in the past I just have no idea where our administration is going to feel with the harm reduction word. Um, so I just took it off for now and it might get added soon. But essentially when we're looking at something like the revive program, right, we're looking at minimizing the harm that's caused from so many people becoming addicted in such a threat that it is to our society right now. Um, so we're looking at minimizing long-term consequences of substance use. We're talking about preventing death from substance use and also reducing any costs that are associated with overdose. So here's where Revive comes in, right? Um, an overdose is a time-sensitive thing and we are primarily focused on that moment in time where we can still influence the outcome, right? Um, we do know that the sooner response, the better the outcome is going to be. So the more people we get trained, yay today, um, the better chance somebody who does experience an overdose is going to have of being identified in a timely manner and responded to. So uh, research has also found that an individual who receives the Narcan or Naloxone, and Narcan is brand name, Naloxone is generic, those as well are used interchangeably frequently, and they're talking about the same thing. But if somebody's received that before emergency response comes, doesn't mean they're not going to be transported to the hospital, but it does mean that they're going to be less likely to have to be admitted for several days, right? Which can be extremely costly. Um, the more people we have trained, again, the better it's going to be identified, better chance it'll have of being identified. And lay people, um, people do, who don't have any kind of medical background, are able to respond just as effectively as, as somebody who does, okay? It doesn't mean that it's in lieu of, but it just means in that moment we can also respond effectively. 
So revive, we're looking at understanding addiction as well. We won't cover that again here because I gave you a much more thorough explanation of what addiction is. Um, we teach people how to identify and respond to an overdose emergency, differentiating between somebody who might be really high and somebody who's actually experiencing an overdose, right? Um, we talk about risk factors. We'll talk about myths here as a group today on how to respond, most of which are um, much worse for the individual who's experiencing the overdose. And then we are gonna go into step-by-step -step instructions on what to do in that emergency, including how to use the different types of naloxone that's out there. So we have two different types of trainings, lay rescuer training, it's about an hour long, um, and anybody can be trained, medical, no medical background, doesn't matter your background, um, everybody and anybody who's willing to should be trained. Then we also offer a training of trainers, we actually have one going on today at the Stryker Room um, at Williamsburg Regional Hospital, we have extra space available, so if any of you are in Williamsburg today and are you know, motivated by attending the lay rest of your training and want to become trainers as well, um, you do have that opportunity here. It lasts three hours and it's just specifically designed to help trainers teach other people how to do the lay rest of your response, right? So I'm happy to say we are over 10,000 people strong now who have actually gotten through this training. Um, and that hasn't been that long ago that I made this slide. And over 150 of our law enforcement agencies have also received some form of training. Either they have a trainer on staff or they've ex they have all been through the training and are carrying Narcan. So that's a huge accomplishment across our state because oftentimes they're the first people on scene, right? So we also have this emergency department pilot program going on, and that includes as well a warm line in region. So if somebody is struggling with um, a substance use disorder or an early recovery and needs additional support, they can call at any time. Um, so that's exciting. They're just starting this, so it's not in every region yet. I'll show you in a minute a slide of the different regions that are, um, we have participating. But it's great news. Um, it's based off of the Anchor ED program in Rhode Island, and it essentially is providing a peer recovery support specialist at the hospital to meet the individual who's experienced an overdose. Um, peer recovery specialist, I imagine most of you are aware of what that individual does, right? It's somebody who has um, been in long-term recovery and is willing to assist other people because of their experiences and help guide and transition them into a lot of the same, um, same areas into recovery as they've experienced or they're aware of, right? And so it's just a helpful transition point. Um, and it's very successful in navigating hospitals and doctors and social workers and every person that you come into contact with, you know, in your early um, recovery, it can be very overwhelming. Um, so they're a very effective um, entity in this transitioning into a recovery-focused um, mindset. And so they are now, again, being placed in hospitals, and they're available to meet individuals there if they've experienced an overdose. These are the different regions that we have, um, and essentially it's the community service board partnering up with different hospitals in each of those regions. So different types of treatment for opioid use disorder, there's medication-assisted treatment, psychosocial interventions, and then there's supportive programs. Different medications that are used, methadone, suboxone, or buprenorphine, and um, the naltrexone, which includes the Vivitrol. Why people incorporate medication-assisted treatment, and there's been a lot of controversy around medication-assisted treatment and if it's substituting one for another and things of that nature, it has been found to be very effective for individuals when used appropriately. And so what we know is when we're talking about an individual's health, right, if we can get them stabilized and into a point of recovery, we can also start focusing on other areas um, and related conditions that we can assist them with either physically, psychosocially, right, um, environmentally. It gives us an opportunity to help with all of the other factors. On the public health side, if somebody is no longer seeking drugs on the street, right, we're gonna see less injecting drug use. Um, it's gonna help to stop the HIV, hepatitis B, and C risk behaviors injecting, right, as well as needle sharing. And public security, it does help to break the drug and crime link that you see when people are in that um, drug-seeking behavior um, mentality, right? So we're looking at either eliminating or reducing um, heroin use. 
eliminating or reducing injecting drug use, improving physical health, psychosocial well-being, eliminating or reducing um, criminal behaviors that are associated with drug use, and then it also engages frequent contact with health professionals, right, and clinicians, because that's a part of the medication program. I'm skipping over the next slide because I forgot to erase it. It's just on methadone, but I'm happy to provide more slides or information outside of here. I just had pulled the other ones and I can't just show one, so that's the reason. Psychosocial interventions, motivational interviewing, right? We've all heard about this. It's essentially helping somebody elicit motivation from inside themselves. A lot of times, individuals are needing to find that motivation in order to assist them in transitioning, right? And so we're helping them do that. Um, we're also helping them to look at some of the inter internal resistance that they have. So if we are um, really wanting to use substances and we also really want to fill in the blank, get a job, be you know, um, fulfilled in some other areas, we help them to see where there's an overlap and where those are butting heads, right? And so it helps them to start to identify prioritizing different areas that they can do much better if they um, alleviate some of the substance use, right? And so it's really just working through those processes and internal resistance and helping to find discrepancies in what we want and what's going on currently. So future wants, current things that are happening, right? And so how we can make changes. Cognitive behavioral therapy, that's where we're starting to look at thoughts and the behaviors associated with those thoughts, right? So we're starting to kind of challenge them. We're looking at people, places, and things that may start to be triggers and creating some boundaries around those. Um, and it's helping to change the way somebody's thinking about themselves, others, as well as their environment. Finally, supportive programs. So social and practical supports, peer recovery coaches, we just talked about them, right? Um, structured peer programs, such as the 12-step recovery programs, smart recovery programs, um, and then family and friends support. If somebody has family and friends that are willing to assist in that process and able to assist in that process, right? They are um, a powerful tool to assist somebody. Doesn't mean everybody has that, though. And so then we're also looking at other supports for them. Woo, okay. I got through that in really good time. So I'm going to open up for some questions, and then we'll take maybe five, ten minutes um, and jump into the training. So yes, please. Okay, yeah. so on the slide where you showed the little check marks about yes. as well. So I was interested that there was only one check mark under tobacco. Uh. <laughs> uh, because I've read and heard, and I'm a former smoker, yeah. I've never been addicted mm -hmm. to anything else, but it was really hard to get off tobacco. So you're talking about the physical withdrawal symptoms, and what we see with, with smoking, with nicotine and tobacco, and it's, we know, one of the worst drugs out there, right? Um, the physical, it's a lot more in the brain and psychological um, with tobacco is what I have seen through the research, and that can play out. You get very stressed. You can get very anxious. You get very cranky, um, things of that nature. But the physical withdrawal, so... Um, when we're looking at, let's just say, heroin, right, you're going to be vomiting. You might have um, extreme tremors or things of that nature. So that's what they're looking at with the level of physical withdrawal. Yes? Well, she made me think of something oh, in treatment now. And I know that things have changed now, no smoking, things like that. But when I was in addiction treatment, we allowed them to smoke. It was more like a damage control. Mm -hmm. Because if we tried to take everything away, they would relapse on everything. So what is the thought these days? You're talking about a harm reduction approach. Yes, harm reduction. Is that still, you know, looked upon? Are they allowed to, in treatment for opioid addiction, are they allowed to smoke in the facility, or they try to get rid of everything? I would, and this is, again, I, that, that's not my expertise, but I would imagine just because we have so many laws on smoking now and bans on smoking, it wouldn't be inside of a facility. You might have designated smoking areas outside. I think that would depend on who the therapist or counselor is and how far progressing the individual is, but I certainly, um, I, I can't, yeah. Yes? No smoking on campus at Farley. Yeah. At the VA, they have a 
smoke area they can go to. Where's that? At the VA. At the VA, so they have a designated smoking area. area. So they offer smoking cessation, they offer the patch and anything you want. They encourage you to quit smoking too, but mm -hmm. they do not require it. Right. And I think that what we're talking about is um, resolving an immediate threat and smoking tends to have a much longer term effect. It doesn't mean that it's not a threat, right? It just tends to take a lot longer to get to the point. Um, when you've been on it for a long time, yeah. And so, right. And so that's what we were talking about with the removal, right? And, and I, some over here that, you know, once you stop taking it, then your mood does destabilize because it's served as an anxiolytic for you and it served as something to calm, maybe help you relax, sleep, things like that, and so you suddenly take it away. However, I think nicotine also um, has some upper qualities about it too, so it's a bit pharmacologically, um, yeah. right. And that is what makes it very hard to quit. I saw a hand back here. No? Okay. Yes. Um, one one oh. thing you were talking about, you were going through oh. things like CBT. And in the beginning, you also talked about how, uh, I want to say, your frontal uh, cortex is like offline, if yeah. you will, yeah. uh, because of all the effects and the impact. And so it seems to me, I, we, how on earth is CBT going to be really the most effective thing when, when it takes so long to even be able to think straight again? And so that and was... As you pointed out, mm -hmm. what seems like a, things that are really bad for you seem okay. And, and that's what so, I left on to. Yeah, so I think what we're looking at is how long somebody has been free from certain substances that are impacting, right? And so we have to have a period of of either abstinence or heavy reduction in order to start really working on restructuring thoughts and processes. But what CBT does help to do is helps to, and this is also kind of where that mindfulness thing comes in, and you're right, if you aren't able to um, process things rationally, right, and we're making kind of spot on decisions, CBT is helping us to not make those spot on decisions. So it's helping us to think about something at least for a moment, just pause, right? And that's also mindfulness is another pretty powerful tool that we can use in recovery and helping people with that. But really pausing to kind of um, take in what it is that's going on, what we're feeling about that. And, um, and also if we act on it, that's something to bring back to therapists or counselors that you're working with and helping to kind of identify future instances where the same types of thoughts and then reactions might happen. The other thing about CBT is you can also go to the lead portion and start changing behavior, not having to worry about the right. thought, start behavior, and then because the behavior creates change in and of itself, you come in the back door with the way they think of it. I like how, yes, beautiful. And that's exactly correct. It doesn't necessarily have to just start with the cognitive part. Yes. Oh, so she was just saying that with CBT, if you aren't quite able to work on the cognitive part, you can start with the behaviors first and kind of make a backdoor approach into the thoughts then that are associated with specific behaviors. But you're working on um, helping guide some of those behaviors. Yeah. I've seen enough brain studies to know that you're not going to be able to affect the thought process for a while. So you start with the behavior. Once the behavior starts to change and they see results, it's tangible. They can start going back door into how they think about it once they've had enough time clean for the brain to start resetting itself. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the brain can reset itself. And depending on what drugs we're talking about, there's different lengths of time that it takes, but it can happen. So it's not that it's always, um, but some of those changes can be long lasting too. So again, it depends on different drugs of choice, but certainly. When we're talking, let's just go back to the medication-assisted treatment, right? That's a period of stabilization while we can start working on other areas of the individual's um, process. Yes? When you're looking at medication-assisted treatment like methadone or suboxone, you've got a period of time. They become 
in my experience, they become very dependent upon this instead. So you have to then, ideally, work them all back to a clean place. Um, my experience has been it's very hard to get them all of that. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Because yeah. I'm basically substituting drugs. I'm not changing behavior. I'm not so, changing conversation. Not being a doctor, not being a prescriber, um, I'll say that different doctors have different approaches to that. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily everybody's idea that anyone who goes into medication assisted treatment should be on it forever. Um, I also am aware that relapse, um, especially off of a period of abstinence, can be fatal. And so I think that there's also really, it's a very fine line in ha helping navigate that process with individuals. And so that would just go to making sure that you know your clients very well. You work with them um, to identify if and when it's an appropriate time to start transitioning down off of um, certain medications. And not all clients go in wanting to be on that forever either. So, I mean, again, it's, it's the relationship between um, whoever is working with the client and, and the patient themselves. Use Suboxone, withdrawn, mm -hmm. relapsed, and they were lucky because they could relapse and come through that right. relapse, but at the same time they go back on Suboxone, but it's the same thing that I'm looking at where it becomes their, own, their, their, their next drug that they use. Because they don't, they, I don't know how they get you know, I don't, I don't know enough about how they can get clean. I, yeah. Well, I, I think that there's still um, a. It's been around for a very long time, and it's been found to be very effective. Um, and so I would just focus more on that than everybody. If if it's everybody needs to get on and off, or what the time period is. Well, partially because I've treated people that have come off some boxing quickly, mm -hmm. and they're in full withdrawal with them. Okay. Yeah. We're, yeah, so I think we're just focusing very heavily on the medical side, and I don't want to overstep my professional. Um, That's fine. Yeah, but it's a great discussion. Yes. And my, my question probably is that uh, that overstep. I'm just wondering how long are people typically on Suboxone? What would be a long enough time to yeah. help them maybe make that transition? Research from my addictions degree. So I'm just going to jump into that step out of my um, state-funded role. <laughs> But research shows that it takes a minimum of six months to stabilize somebody. So a minimum of six months, and that is just on a general side. So just because we've stabilized somebody doesn't mean that everything is set for them to just stop using after six months. That means that it's a minimum of six months to get them to a stable position, and it might take them longer to stabilize as well. So. Anybody want to switch gears? <laughs> I'm just um, Okay, so let's take a break. And um, if you guys can be back at, let's just say, 53, I think that'll give us enough time to get through the training and to get through the hands-on piece. All right. Woohoo, so now we get to get trained in Revive. Um, I want to throw one thing out, because I think I had somebody who was kind of like, well, maybe I might come across this. Um, and my work function or, you know, but I don't really know anybody who is um, outside of work who has an opioid use disorder and, you know, it's very unlikely that I'll come across this anywhere else. So personal experience that I had um, was not work related or nor school related or anything of that nature. Um, I live in a pretty sheltered environment, I guess you could call it. You don't see much happening, right? There's not a lot of crime. There's not, at least visibly, a lot of... Um, drug use, and I was on my way home one day and ended up behind a t car that was extremely, you know, intoxicated. You could just tell, swerving, um, almost hit somebody, and this was just a little neighborhood where our, um, our little league is on, right? And so almost hit a car, kept going kind of face-to-face -face with cars. Um, very unnerving, right, because you're prepared for it at work, and you're prepared to come across things like this um, when you're prepared, um, so it's a bit different. Um, and so I was on the phone with the 911 and following this individual just to be able to respond if, if need be um, to an accident. I didn't know what it was. Um, fortunately, our fire met us. Um, the person ended up hitting a trash can, which stopped them, best case scenario. Um, very intoxicated on opioids. 
So I share that I did not need to use any of my emergency response, but I came pretty close to having to. Um, and that is not in my professional, right, or educational or any of those boxes that I would likely anticipate coming across something like this, but that was in a very personal place where you just don't expect to. Again, I share that because you just never know, and with the number of, um, you know, individuals struggling with addiction to opioids these days, it could be your next door neighbor, it could be in your neighborhood, it could be, and this ended up being literally in front of my neighborhood, um, which was just kind of wild. So you just don't know when you need to be prepared. And that's why I say the sooner the response, the better the outcome, and the more of us that are trained, right, and have gone through this, the better we'll be able to respond, huh? Exactly. Exactly. And that's where opioids have taken us now. So that being said, oh, I forgot I moved into that. Okay. So Revive was a pilot program in 2013. Um, General Assembly set us out to see if we could get something like this moving in Southwest Virginia and Richmond, which were both getting pre hit pretty hard. Um, and then they came back and all talked about it at the next General Assembly session and decided in 2015 to remove that pilot label, um, that it is something we needed across the state. And again, as I mentioned, the more people we have trained, the better. Um, so they also had some laws surrounding this to support using um, naloxone, including um, what we call immunity from civil liability, which is similar to Good Samaritan. If you, in good faith, are helping somebody who you believe is experiencing an overdose, you can't get sued. I have never heard of anybody attempting to sue somebody else or family member attempting to sue somebody for trying to help, but just an FYI so you don't feel like you need to hesitate to try and help someone. Our law enforcement firefighters can now carry naloxone, and we're under our written order. Um, we've talked about that, so I'm not going to cover that again. Um, we also have a safe reporting of overdoses law, and everybody has a training guide, I believe, that should have been printed out. So everything that goes into the safe reporting of overdoses law is in there, and I'd encourage you to read through it to get a full understanding. But what its intention was, was our Office of the Attorney General wanted people to make the call sooner than later and not be worried that they might get charged for some of their own illegal behavior um, as a result of calling and having law enforcement, per se, come over, right? And so they implemented this to um, provide some immunity if they're charged with certain offenses um, from, from being, right, from actually, it's a defense. Right, so if you go, then you have a defense and you can have the charges dropped. But it's specific charges, including possession and intoxication. Um, and you have to do five specific things. And so again, it's all outlawed, outlaid in there. But two of those are you have to call, right? You have to be the person to call and you have to stay with the individual because we know that's going to help them have a better outcome. So how does an overdose happen? Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have a natural opiate system, right, in our brain, and we have these opiate receptors in our brain that intend, are intended for the opiates to receive and activate. Um, and so when too many opioids flood that system, part of that is on our brain stem, which controls our breathing, central nervous system, heart rate, right, all of that. And so when too many opioids flood that, it slows everything down to, to a point where it eventually stops. Um, and so that's what's going on in an overdose. This is a chart of different overdose, or opioids, excuse me. Um, and we just like to give people a general idea of everything that is considered an opioid because what you're learning today is opioid specific. Um, it wouldn't work on methamphetamine or on benzodiazepines or any other drugs. It only works on opioids. So we just like to let people know kind of what those are. As well as street terms, which um, unfortunately, if it's um, somebody that you just come across, it might be that that they're using, right? Um, dog food is something people use for heroin. Um, so we like for people to just be aware of some of these terms that are out there so they know what they're dealing with if they're responding. So how can you tell the difference between somebody who's overdosed and really high? I'm just going to open this up to you all. You probably already know. Just shout it out. How do you know if somebody's overdosed? Non-responsive. That's a huge one, right? So if they're not responding to you, if they're not speaking to you, if they're not responding, if you're giving them a nudge, right? Um, we'll teach you a very specific um, way to find out if they're responsive in a little bit. Yeah, non-responsive. Their color changes. Color changes. So what colors? Uh, 
Uh, it'll go from like pink or like red to like a bluish kind of tint. Mm -hmm. So bluish, grayish, um, depending on skin color. Yep. Yeah. Oh, don't don't scratch. I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> Pale or clammy skin um, means that the individual is shocky, right? That their heart's not beating, they're not getting any oxygen. Y'all think of anything else, huh? Breathing, yeah. They're not breathing. Shallow breathing. Snoring really loud. That's actually one of them. Um, anybody know what it's called? Agonal breathing, yeah. So. It's called agonal breathing, and essentially what happens is your body isn't being able to suck in air. So it's kind of this very loud, like, you can look it up on YouTube if you want to hear it. I'm sure they have videos of it. Um, but it sounds like, if you've never heard it before, very loud snoring, right? So if somebody's at risk um, of an opioid overdose and you hear very loud snoring, Raise the, raise the antenna that it could be um, a sign. Yeah. Is that the group called death rattles? Yes. How is it? Okay. Agnal breathing, death rattle, yes. Yeah. Anything else you guys can think of? What about heart rate? They don't have a pulse, right? That could also be a sign. Ready pulse or real erratic pulse. Mm -hmm. So naloxone, um, and I've kind of, I'm going to throw a couple science-y terms just because I like it and it's fun to learn science. Um, so these green blocks are the opioids. This is our opiate receptor that I mentioned, right, that we have in the brain. And then those little pearls, um, gold pearls, are the naloxone. So when the opioid is administered, I told you it binds, right, to that opiate receptor. When it binds, it activates that receptor. So it causes analgesia. It also causes feelings of euphoria, right? All of that occurs because it's been activated. So that makes the opioid an agonist. Agonists activate, OK? Naloxone, when it's administered, has a stronger attraction to the same receptor site. So it will actually compete for it and bump the opioid off. Um, and it binds to the receptor site. It's an antagonist, so it doesn't activate anything. The only purpose it serves is to block the opioid from binding and activating, okay? So agonist activates, antagonist, no activation at all, just blocks, okay? Um, so because it doesn't activate anything, you can't misuse it, right? There's no, it's like drinking water. I guess you can kind of misuse water, we hear sometimes, but you just, you don't get any effect from it. Um, it doesn't activate anything. You can't take too much of it, but if you give too much too quick to somebody who's dependent, what could happen? Withdrawal, yeah. So that could certainly happen if you administer too much, but it's not going to hurt somebody. You can't overdose from it, again, because it just binds to the receptor, but it doesn't activate anything. If it's given accidentally, Nothing. So if I walked into a room and there's a 50-year-old man on the ground and on the table over here there's a syringe, there's a spoon, right? He seems to have all of the signs. And I respond to him because I think that he's overdosed on opioids and I give him the, no the Narcan or the Naloxone. Um, five seconds later, his teenage daughter comes in the room and said, oh my God, he had a heart attack. Please help him. He walked in on me. Right. It's not going to help a heart attack, okay? Because it only works on a specific receptor site, but it's not going to hurt it, right? So when in doubt, if you think maybe, go ahead and respond. It's not going to hurt anything. Our EMT, our advanced life support trucks, had that as part of their cocktail for a long time. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them, that if they found somebody unresponsive and didn't know why, it was just part of a cocktail they would give. Because if it's an opioid, it's going to work, right? If it's not an opioid, it's not going to do anything. It's going to be the same dose for an adult or a child. So I always give a two-year-old toddler versus a six-foot-eight linebacker. They're both going to get the same dose. Okay? Um, and why is that? It's going to a specific receptor site in the brain, and it's just blocking those opioids. 
So what are some risk factors that might make somebody more likely to experience an overdose? Get it off the street, yeah. Just like I said, if I walked, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of a really weird name. Um, let's go with Amir, because I don't think we have an Amir in the room, right? Is there an Amir in the room? I'm Amira. Okay, good. If I went to Amir, who's my dealer on the street, um, and I bought anything from him, is there an ingredients label on there? No. Yeah, exactly. And does he know what's in there? Probably not. Yeah. I mean, maybe if he went and got a prescription from the pharmacy and that's exactly what he was selling, but that's very infrequent, right? Most of the time, it's gone through several different people before it gets to him. Um, yeah, exactly. Or if you're going to somebody new, let's say Amir got arrested and so I'm going to a different person, right? It's a different formulation. Oh, yes, ordering online. Don't even get me started. New psychoactive substances. What else? What other risk factors? Yeah. Um, like existing medical conditions? Yeah, so existing medical conditions. What, what are you maybe talking about? Say that again. Cancer, organ Cancer organs. Cancer organs, yes. You're right on point. So if you have, let's just go with our kidney and liver. Um, our liver metabolizes drugs. Our kidney eliminates typically. So if we have compromisation on one of those two areas, drugs aren't being metabolized correctly, they're not being eliminated, right? So they could be what? Building up. Um, what about heart conditions or breathing conditions, right? If we're already at risk of compromisation in those areas, taking something that's compromising that further could certainly be a risk factor. Yeah, I mean, she was asking about, about immune disorders. Um, possibly, but again, we're really looking at um, overdose being something that's impacting those certain areas. So not necessarily making us sick, which would be an immune disorder. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't count it out. You know, certainly. Tolerance. Tolerance. That's huge. We were talking earlier. Um, can you? Well, doesn't matter. Um, Number one population who we're unfortunately losing as a result of opioid overdose is newly released offenders. Because they come out with no tolerance, right? And a lot of times they aren't receiving enough treatment in, um, and so when they get out it's just kind of been a waiting game. Um, so this is the number one thing taking their lives. And then, I, not the number one population this is affecting, I apologize, I'm going to back up, but this is the number one thing that takes the lives of newly released offenders. Um, somebody who's been in treatment for a while, right? Um, if they have an episode of relapse, they don't have tolerance anymore. Um, and also, if somebody's had a medical illness for a period of time and hasn't used because of it, right? Again, we're talking about tolerance. What else? Yeah, if you've had a prior overdose, there it's not a scientifically, you know, whatever. But yes, if you've overdosed before, you're likely to experience another episode. What was that? Alcohol. alcohol, yeah, so drugs, mixing drug on drug. So alcohol, benzodiazepines, what do they do? Depress central nervous system. Opioids, depress the central nervous system. Yeah, so you're just compounding factors. Um, what about taking an upper and a downer? Still depressing, it's a pharmacological, you know, bomb that's going off and they can actually exacerbate the effects of one another. They are not eliminating the effects. They don't cancel each other out. Yeah? It could appear that way though. Like if you take an opiate and then you take a stimulant on top of it, you may not feel as high on the opiate, so you may take more and then when the stimulant wears off, you feel instantly in the overdose. Exactly. You're absolutely correct. Even without the stimulant wearing off can still happen. All right, we got all of those. We did not talk about using a loan, though. Um, if you're using a loan, very unlikely somebody's going to find you in enough time to help you, right? All right, so let's talk about some myths um, that you might have heard of to reverse an overdose. Get them up and walk them around. Okay, get them up and walk them around. Um, 
Why won't that work? Say that again? You're not addressing what needs to be addressed. What needs to be addressed? The breathing and the depressed function. The receptors? Yeah. So they're not doing anything up there. And why is that a bad idea? Speeding it up. Not necessarily. Well, speeding it up if it's in the blood system, yeah, that could. But if they're overdosed, they're unconscious, right? So it's not a good idea to have carry somebody who's pretty much dead weight around. And if they fall, it's going to be a hard hit, right? Um, so yeah, that's a good one. What else? Cold showers, ice baths. Cold showers, ice baths, yeah. So, yes, I'm coming back to that one. Cold shower and ice bath. So if we think about water, why won't water work? Because it's on the receptors. So it's not going to do anything to your receptor site. Um, why is water a bad idea? Because they're unconscious, yes, and they could drown. Absolutely. Ice baths, and so I'm actually just going to pull the ice from that. You didn't quite say it, but ice packing. How many people here have heard about ice packing? Nobody? Man, this is the number one thing I hear people try to do. So ice packing is when you pack either the genitals, armpits with ice, right, which does what? Cools down the body temperature, and that does what? Yes. Yes. So you are, again, compounding, slowing down the central nervous system. You're making things happen a lot faster. I will tell you, all of the trainings I do, almost all of them, I have somebody that says, Amira, mm -mm, did that yesterday. It worked. Why did it work? They were not overdosed. They may not have been, you know, making any effort to respond to you, but if that pulled them out of it, they weren't overdosed. And if they were you could be making that happen a lot faster. Coffee. Yeah, let's drink some coffee. <laughs> so, well, I'm gonna, just going to start. Why, why is that a bad idea? It's considered well, a stimulus. But also, they're unconscious. They're unconscious. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. give them any liquid. Yeah. And so, yeah, most likely you're giving them something because they maybe took pills, right? And so it's in their stomach, and we're trying to soak it up. Um, but by the time they've overdosed, it's where? On the brain, right? It's on the brain receptors. So the bread, the coffee, even if we could get it down their throat without choking them to death on the way down, right? It's not going to do anything up here. Yeah. And same with trying to get it out, right? So having them vomit could cause them to aspirate or choke um, that way as well. Um, and it won't help. Even if we could do it without hurting them, it won't help. You guys think of any other ones that I might not have covered yet? Shaking, was that in the back? Yeah. Shaking them, right? Um, so when you're responding, and if you haven't gone through a training like this and you don't know any different, you're desperate to help somebody next to you who is at risk of losing their life. So you're doing whatever you can to try and get a response out of them. So yes, shaking them, right? Kicking or punching them, trying to get a response could actually hurt them a lot worse than help them. There's one other myth up here. I don't know that anybody's going to even think to say it. Um, injecting them with something like salt water, um, milk, yes. So these are common. I know it sounds wild, but these are common in areas where our medical response takes a very long time, and I mean like 45 minutes or longer, right? There's very, very low medical response. And again, desperate is desperate. So if somebody's injected something, they might be trying to dilute it. You don't know what you're doing. I mean, it's not people who have any understanding of the biological aspects of it. You're just thinking, let's get it out. Let's dilute, right? It won't work um, because none of that is going to cross through the blood-brain barrier. Um, for those of you who know what I'm talking about and for those of you who don't, it doesn't matter. It's not going to get there, right? Um, and it will, in fact, end up leaving them with a much worse condition, probably a very bad infection that could kill them later, take their life. Why would even somebody think of them? So it's, this is, and again, we're talking very, very rural um, mountain areas. There was this, I don't know, rumor, I've, there's no scientific basis for it, that milk helps um, methamphetamine overdose. Yeah. I think that 
they think that milk is kind of bland and might neutralize the effect. They don't understand anything about brain chemistry. Exactly. Yeah. Like with yeah. alcohol. Just, or or body chemistry. chemistry. Yeah. Right. So that's why they do that. Mm -hmm. I got that. All right. So those are the myths. We are now moving into this. The only thing that's going to work on those brain receptors is naloxone. It's the only thing that's going to make it up there and actually compete. So for that reason, we're going to show you how to use it. Um, there are three types of naloxone out there, so we're going to show you how to use all three. There's tables set up around the room, and so um, my colleagues are here to assist me with you all. Um, what I would ask is that you just sort of evenly um, disperse around each table and We'll have one of us going through step by step with you everything. But before that, I'm just going to run through really quick, quickly with you. The very first thing you do is check for responsiveness. So we want to see that first, right? Because we're talking about are they overdosed or are they just really high? Um, and so the quick and easy way to check for responsiveness, it's a fun group activity we can do together, is a nice sternum rub. Okay? So, yes. I'm going to have everybody make a fist with me, put those knuckles out. Yeah. You guys are such good sports. Um, do not do this very hard because it can hurt. But what you're going to do is put the knuckles on your chest bone, that hard part of your chest, and you can do one of three things. You can either rock your knuckles up and down, okay? You can just move that top layer of skin up and down, or you can rake up and down. If you do that with enough pressure, and somebody does not respond, we can consider them unresponsive. Yes. So we're going to do that. The second thing we're going to do is administer the medication and then put them in what's called the recovery position. Anybody here not know the recovery position? Okay, good. So I'm going to actually show a video and pause it. Well, not show the full video, but I'm going to pause it up here so you can see somebody in the recovery position. But essentially what you're doing is you're going to roll them over onto their side. Place the hands under their head and tilt the head down, okay? So it's on the side and down. And then you're going to either bend the top leg over or extend it straight out. And the purpose of that is that they don't roll over. And if they do get sick after the medication's been administered, it's going to come out and not choke them, okay? So that's the purpose behind it. And while they're in that position, we're calling 911, all right? And then we're going to initiate rescue breathing or CPR, depending on what tool you have in your tool belt. Also, depending on what 911 operator is telling you to do, because they can give you advanced instructions. And then we'll reassess. OK? So yay, here we go. I'm going to just um, have you guys break up into um, groups. We've got three tables. Again, just find a table with a man again. So what are the signs of overdose? A lot of them are involved with respiration. Um, and what that means is somebody struggling for air, gurgling for air, sucking air. Um, it could be somebody unconscious. If I'm walking up on somebody and I see their blue in their lips and their fingertips, I know we've got a problem. Um, and how do I know the difference if I'm out and about, if somebody's just really high or in danger of an overdose or overdosing? Um, one of the quickest ways you can really discriminate between the two is asking the person if they're okay. So if somebody's talking, they're not in an overdose. If after I engage with somebody and they do not, they're not verbalizing, I'm going to be verbal with them. I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to touch you. I'm going to give you a sternal rub. And so bring your knuckles up, bring it to the sternum bone, and rub. And if they're not going to wake up at that point, they're in an overdose. So if stimulation of the sternum rub is not going to work, what we're suggesting at that point is 911, rescue breathing, and Narcan. In an overdose kit, there are a few different things. Two boxes of unassembled Narcan with the nasal spray device attached. A face shield for rescue breathing. A pamphlet with overdose recognition and response instructions. And a card with instructions on how to assemble Narcan. This is Narcan. The box doesn't actually say Narcan. It is labeled by its generic name, Naloxone Hydrochloride. Narcan and Naloxone are the same thing.
take off the two yellow caps from the plastic delivery device. Take the nasal attachment and screw it onto the top of the plastic delivery device. There are little tabs or wings that help you screw it in place. Get the vial of Narcan and remove the red cap. The vial is made of glass and is fragile, so don't bite off the cap. It could break and cut your mouth. Gently screw the Narcan vial into the delivery device. You will feel it lightly catch. If you see the liquid dripping out of the top, stop screwing. Now you are ready to administer the Narcan. Hold it like a syringe and spray about half the medicine up one side of the nose of the person who is overdosing and half up the other side of the nose. If the joint leaks, it is on crooked. Unscrew and put it on straight. You can see that the vial is marked with hashes. There are two milliliters of medicine in the vial, so where the one is, is half the medicine. This is a pre-measured dose. You will need to use it all. Remember that the informational materials in the kit can guide you through the process. While you are waiting for the Narcan to reverse the overdose, do some rescue breathing. So what we're really trying to do is get people to get a plan. Get a plan of action with their using friends, with their community that they're in, and saying, hey, this is the signs of overdose, man, and if this goes down, this is what I expect you to do. Having a plan of action hopefully is gonna take down some of that anxiety. Um, no matter what, somebody dying you care about or don't know in front of you is scary and it is anxious. Uh, but having a plan in place hopefully is going to cut some of that, that negative stuff out. that explains how to use this set. So actually there are three different ways to administer it. So this card explains how to use this. And then two stickers. Now these don't go on your car. They actually go on the person after you administer the naloxone. So if you use two doses, use those stickers. And you want to put them either on like because if you put them on their skin, they might be clammy and the stickers might fall. So this is, so folks know, so responders know that they've been given a lot. This is what you keep with you here. And I think she's going to show the um, videos. So, so for step four, uh, rest and breathing, of course, you're going to want to mask. So when you go to the pharmacy, you'll most likely get this one. If you go to the health department, you'll most likely get this one. This is what my department is. This is the, the, the Narcan itself, like the Narcan brand. And it's just a, just a nasal spray. So for this one, this is a little more complicated. Um, colors come off. So you take... And there's still no response. Both of these. So there's three different products that I may have access to. I'm going to show you how to use the opposite. The first one is the most complicated one. And I'll pass it through. This screws in here. And this screws in here. 
So this is called a syringe and atomizer. Um, we don't teach people how to use half. You can see it's marked here. So you'll just like a regular syringe, so you'll half in one nostril and half in the other. So to go from start to finish. Okay. So you'll come upon someone who is unresponsive, and your first thing is to see if they're responsive. See if they are responsive, right? So sternal rub. You can do an ear pinch as well, but you don't want to do anything that you know will bruise them or the old or whatever. CPR, like, hey, are you okay? <laughs> I call mine Lemmy. His name Larry. I don't know what this guy's name is, but so you also check. You can listen for their breathing, and as you're listening, you can look down to see if they're. Chest is rising. Step two, administer naloxone. So depending on which one you have, so this one, he's not responsive, so shake this off here. So colors come off. This comes off here. This one that you get in the pharmacy actually is colored. It's like blue, I think sometimes, or red. And so you'll take this off as well. This is glass, so you want to be careful with it. Then you twist it in, and if the, if the, this has water, it's only water. So you twist it, if it starts to come out, you've twisted it far enough. So you have to test hard enough. You've gone too far. This goes in like this, and it'll stop when it's, and then, Halfway down in, in one nostril and then half in the other nostril. Okay. The CPR dummy it knows it's not going to be the same. <laughs> we just put it in their nose. <laughs> but realistically, they'll be on their side. No, no, no. They, they only go into the recovery position after you've oh, been inserted in the lock zone. Okay. Yep. Is the it's, it's not really, this is not actually liquid, it's like an atomizer. It's like a nose spray. Oh, that's just like it just, yeah, because oh, when it comes through this, it's a mist. Okay, so it's not just water. Yes, that's an excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> and I was wondering, I guess that answered the question about like that one is like a. This is exactly just a, just like nose spray that you just, and But this one only goes in one nostril and you give the whole dose in one nostril. The, the naloxone lasts 20, 30, maybe 45 minutes. Um, so once that wears off, the opioids are still there, can revive the receptor. Yes. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. Please see indications and important safety information at the end of this video. Also, please see accompanying full prescribing information in the use of this product. Narcan nasal spray is an emergency treatment for a known or suspected opioid overdose. The appropriate use of Narcan nasal spray can help you save a life. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. If you encounter someone who is unresponsive and you suspect an overdose, first shake their shoulders and shout their name. Kevin. Ask if he or she is okay. Hey, can you hear me? Check for signs of an overdose, unresponsive to touch or voice. Breathing is slow, uneven, or has stopped. Snoring, gasping, or gurgling sounds. Fingernails or lips are blue or purple. Administer Narcan nasal spray as quickly as possible if someone is unresponsive and an opioid overdose is suspected, even when in doubt, because prolonged respiratory depression may result in damage to the central nervous system or even death. Lay the person on their back to receive a dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove Narcan nasal spray from the box. Peel back the tab with the circle to open it. Remove and review the printed quick start guide inside the package. Hold the Narcan nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. 
Do not press the plunger to test or prime the device. If you do, you will waste all or part of the dose of medication. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under the neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into one nostril until your fingers on either side of the nozzle are against the person's nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the full dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove the device from the nostril after giving the dose. After you have given this medication, seek emergency help right away. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. I'm with somebody who stopped breathing. I, I think they've had an overdose. Move the person on their side after giving Narcan nasal spray. If possible, put their hands under their head and bend their upper leg forward. This helps prevent the person from rolling onto their stomach. This is known as the recovery position. Continue to watch the person closely. If they do not wake up or respond to your voice or touch, or if they do not seem to be breathing normally within two to three minutes, use a new Narcan nasal spray to give an additional dose in the other nostril. Acute opiate withdrawal symptoms may occur from use of Narcan nasal spray in patients who are opioid dependent. Symptoms include body aches, diarrhea, increased heart rate or tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, goosebumps, also known as piloerection, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering or trembling, abdominal cramps, weakness and increased blood pressure. When the emergency is over, put the Narcan nasal spray back in its box and throw it away in a place that is away from the reach of children. In addition to watching this video, please read the quick start guide that comes with Narcan nasal spray before using it. Talk to a healthcare professional if you have any questions about how to administer Narcan nasal spray. Please read the indications and important safety information that follows. Store Narcan nasal spray at room temperature between 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 25 degrees centigrade. Do not freeze Narcan nasal spray. Keep Narcan nasal spray in the box until ready to use. Protect from light. Replace Narcan nasal spray before the expiration date on the box. Keep Narcan nasal spray and all medicines out of the reach of children. Indications. Narcan naloxone hydrochloride nasal spray is an opioid antagonist indicated for the emergency treatment of known or suspected opioid overdose as manifested by respiratory and or central nervous system depression. Narcan nasal spray is intended for immediate administration as emergency therapy in settings where opioids may be present. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Important safety information. Narcan nasal spray is contraindicated in patients known to be hypersensitive to naloxone hydrochloride. Seek emergency medical assistance immediately after initial use, keeping the patient under continued surveillance. Risk of recurrent respiratory and CNS depression. Due to the duration of action of naloxone relative to the opioid, keep the patient under continued surveillance and administer repeat doses of naloxone using a new nasal spray with each dose as necessary while awaiting emergency medical assistance. Risk of limited efficacy with partial agonists or mixed agonist antagonists. Reversal of respiratory depression caused by partial agonists or mixed agonists antagonists such as buprenorphine and pentazazine may be incomplete. Larger or repeat doses may be required. Precipitation of severe opioid withdrawal. Use in patients who are opioid dependent may precipitate opioid withdrawal characterized by body aches, diarrhea, increased heart rate, tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, goosebumps, piloerection, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering or trembling, abdominal cramps, weakness, and increased blood pressure. In neonates, opioid withdrawal may be life-threatening if not recognized and properly treated and may be characterized by convulsions, excessive crying, and hyperactive reflexes. Monitor for the development of opioid withdrawal. Risk of cardiovascular, CV, effects. Abrupt post-operative reversal of opioid depression may result in adverse CV effects. These events have primarily occurred in patients who had pre-existing CV disorders or received other drugs that may have similar adverse CV effects. Monitor these patients closely in an appropriate healthcare setting after use of naloxone hydrochloride.
The following adverse reactions were observed in a Narcan nasal spray clinical study. Increased blood pressure, musculoskeletal pain, headache, nasal dryness, nasal edema, nasal congestion, and nasal inflammation. See instructions for use and full prescribing information in the use of this product. To report suspected adverse reactions, contact Adapt Pharma Inc. at 1-844-4-NARCAN, 1-844-462-7226, or the FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088, or www.fda.gov slash medwatch. FCO no auto pressure. injector no is identical to the EpiPen. Okay? So when you're in an emergency, when you're ready to use it, this trainer contains it. It talks to you through it. If you want to use safety card, that's why you're going to get to practice with it today. <clears throat> There's no actual needle in this one. So this one has a needle, but it's not an exposed needle unless you're pressing. So the moment I took it off, the needle is retracted back into it. It goes through two to, two to three layers of clothing depending on how thick. So like winter as well, yeah. So you guys can practice. All right. So and where we, do you put it? I guess that part. Huh? Where do you put it? So it says put it in the thigh, but if somebody doesn't have a thigh, and that happens on occasion, you'd want to put it in a median muscly area. Okay. So like a hip will work, um, shoulder works, right? Anything like that. If it's a child, if it's a toddler or a baby, pinch the skin on their thigh when you, when you do it. Okay? So you'll all get hands on for all three of those. So I just administered one dose of naloxone. I should do what? Put a, put a sticker on. So you're going to put the sticker either on clothing or hair, because if it's on skin and it's clammy skin, right, it could fall off. Or if they get up and they feel it, they might knock it off, right? So we're going to go ahead and put the sticker on. We're going to say he's wearing a shirt. And then I'm putting him over into his recovery position. His arms go underneath his head. We have the picture there. Um, leg goes over. And while he's here, I am calling 911. I have somebody. I think they be there. Having an overdose, I've given them naloxone. I can do rescue breathing. Is there anything else I should be doing while I wait? Okay, and they're either going to tell me, here's how you do compressions, or I'm just going to do rescue breathing because that's what I know how to do. Okay, so they're on the phone, probably on speaker here, and I'm going to get down and I'm going to give them some breaths. For rescue breathing, we're doing one breath every five seconds. Okay. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand. Yes. You want to give a slow, normal breath. If you breathe too fast or too much at once, it fills up the stomach and it'll cause them to throw up, okay? We have a one-way valve and we're sealed, so that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we just want it to be very slow and controlled, just like if you were taking a normal breath. And you're actually, in real life, putting your mouth on the So your mouth goes here and this piece goes inside the mouth. And then you've got everything on I'm just simulating, because again, it doesn't. It's my, my kindergarten blocks here that just don't fit right. But yes, it would actually be in his mouth. I would have my mouth on top of that and I'd be blowing it. And it yep. So one every five seconds. Count out loud. There's a purpose behind that, right? If you're in an emergency, what tends to happen? Everything is like fast forward times 10, right? So counting out loud helps to make sure you're not giving too many breaths too quickly. Okay, so that's the purpose. So we're gonna do that for three minutes, okay? Unless they respond, right? And if they respond, we can go ahead and stop and give them some space. But if they don't respond in three minutes, we're gonna give them a second dose. Whether it's the syringe and atomizer, whether it's this, we'll have two doses of everything. Or if it's the FCO auto injector, a full second dose, okay? After that, I've got a, yes, three minutes. So, and in the three minute period that I'm waiting, what am I doing? 
breathing. Rescue CPR. breathing, yeah. CPR, if you know CPR, exactly. So I put another sticker on. I'm putting him back on his side for a few seconds, again, just to see if it kicks in, right? Okay. Has it kicked back in? He's not giving any signs of recovery. I'm going to go back to my rescue breathing. Okay. And this time, because it's I only had two doses on me, I'm just going to keep going until somebody gets there to assist, right? Because we've already called 911. So they're on their way. Questions? What if I had, let's say, like, how many doses would you stop at if you had more than two? If you have more than two, you can continue every three minutes. Follow the same process. Sure. Yeah. Um, Good question. I mean, what, what, what it make? With some of the drugs that we have out there, right, that we know are getting mixed in, it could certainly take more than two. It doesn't mean that the two you're giving aren't starting to help bump those opioids off of the receptors. Um, it may take more than two doses. Likely, you don't have a six minute wait before your ambulance gets there, right? Also, is it but it's not always. Yeah. Is it cumulative? So if yes. I'm well, given um, one day, and it's 45 minutes, and I add another 45 minutes of lasting time. In other words, the naloxone lasts half hour to 45 minutes. So you're saying if we gave a dose, our response did not be five minutes later, they didn't respond to the first one, right? Is that what you're saying in your scenario? So this is the scenario that could happen. I just gave him his first dose, I put him on his side, and I called 911, and during that period, he starts to start to come to, okay? Great. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to do what I can to keep him calm and let him know emergency is on the way that he was overdosed. Um, and it's going to wear off too, right? Because if he's in acute withdrawal, it's going to be uncomfortable. Not everybody who we um, have to respond to is going to be in withdrawal. It could just be somebody who a child might have stepped on a fentanyl patch. That's happened before. Um, an elderly patient might have taken more medication than they should have. That's happened before, right? Um, so they're not necessarily going to go into withdrawal, but if it is somebody in withdrawal um, and they're experiencing lots of negative physical reactions, talk to them. Try and help them stay calm. If they leave, don't stand in their way, right? You can try and figure out where they're going or try and guide whoever responds um, to the direction they went in, but certainly don't put yourself in any kind of risk because you're trying to, to keep them there, but certainly do what you can to come there. Um, but they responded, that's great, that's the outcome we were looking for. We're waiting for medical, for some reason they don't get there, 45 minutes goes by and they have now gone back into an overdose. We're going to start over, so we're going to check for that responsiveness again, and if no response, we're going to give them the second dose then. Okay. Another question on that training. Yeah. They respond. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. EMTs have not arrived. Yeah. They get up and start to leave because they're in the mm -hmm. They use it. What might happen if they use again? Yeah. It's blocked. It's Their receptor is blocked from the naloxone, so it's going to not be effective. Oh, right. My concern is that because if somebody's going to roll, they want to stop that discomfort. Of course. And you can let them know naloxone, it's, it's been administered, it's going to be a period of time before anything can take effect. If you were to take something, probably you're wasting. In terms of wasting your opioids. <laughs> Use that later. Use that later. This doesn't make it. Their opioid doesn't exacerbate No. There's no inverse effect to it at all. It's just, it wears off and it's done. So are any of these uh, ways of administering better than another? Uh, equal? So the only product, this is not FDA approved, um, because there's more user error associated. If you don't twist it on correctly, right, it might not work. If you don't twist it on at all and you just try to, you know, hold this on top and, and shove this in but you didn't twist, right, it won't work. So there's things that could go wrong with the product, but if it's used appropriately, it's just as effective as the other two products. I'm actually turning my mic on just to cover a few um, follow-up things and questions that have come in about the medication. Um, if you wanted to get it from your local health department, they are able to dispense it at no charge. They would be dispensing the Narcan nasal spray, right? The one that's already assembled. You peel back the label and are ready to use it. Um, so you would just have to go to your local health department. You'd want to call them first because typically they have maybe one person who will room um, around the health district and that's the person that can dispense. So you want to make sure to let them know 
um, that you're coming for it, and they'll tell you when that person's available. Alternatively, um, there are trainings that it is dispensed at, and so if you visit the Revive website, you'd find it on the DBHDS webpage. Um, you'll be able to find a list of training events that are going around, and it'll say Narcan nasal spray being dispensed at this training. We talked about the standing order and that invisible prescription that's floating over your head. The Revive cards that you guys got um, from your trainer, and if you did not get it, make sure you grab one. I can get it for you. Um, those little blue cards show that you've been through this training. So at the pharmacy side, you can't waive counseling on how to use it unless you've gone through the training, okay? So this shows that you've already been trained. You don't have to be retrained. Um, one other thing that I would just kind of like to go through, people get a re really stuck on the compressions versus breathing um, on occasion. And so there was research done compressions versus breathing to see if one was better than the other, right? And so they just looked at if somebody received compressions only versus somebody who received breathing only, they found both to be equally as effective. The only time there was a positive difference was when it was full CPR, so compressions and breathing.